Welcome. My name is Peter Toy, and I'm one of the English pastors at Braille Trail Baptist Church. Thank you for deciding to join with us as we study the Word of God together. Today we'll be looking at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34, as we continue on in our series through the book of Acts. And the title for the message today is How to Live a Life of Witnessing. But before we look into the Word, let's look at the Lord together. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your word. I pray, Lord, as we look at it, that by your Holy Spirit, you would open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts, so we might hear you, we might see the truth in your word, and we may be transformed in our hearts. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. How do we live a life of witnessing? I don't know what your experience with personal evangelism is. For me, I've kind of wavered back and forth from trying to avoid it and feeling guilty to fits of activity. I remember one time um, I was riding back on the train, back to university, and I was seated beside um, a young student. I didn't know him, but I felt um, the urge to share the gospel with him. And I did. I took out a piece of paper and I drew out the bridge illustration, a gospel presentation that I'd learned. And I, I think he even prayed a prayer at the end. But I can't get out of my head the image of his face through this whole interaction is like a deer at nighttime being caught in the headlights of a car. I had him trapped and he couldn't get out. It's kind of like um, this uh, video clip from the movie Wilson. Go. Have you heard the good news? Oh, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Only difference in my presentation and uh, that video clip is I didn't say just kidding. I went through the whole thing. You know, I've always longed to be able to share my faith in such a, a normal, organic way that it just flows out of my life rather than being something put on, something that feels so awkward. How do we live a life of witnessing? Well, today we're going to be looking at a model. His name is Paul. And Paul was a person who shared his faith wherever he went and whatever situation he found himself in. And I have four points for this message. The first point is have a heart for people and a heart for God. Number two, make use of every opportunity. Number three, begin where the listener is at. And number four, persevere in our witnessing. Let's take a look at the first point. Have a heart for people and a heart for God. Take a look at Acts chapter 17, verse 6. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. In our previous weeks, we've seen how Paul ventured out on his second missionary journey with Silas and also later with Timothy. And they traveled through Asia Minor came to Macedonia, felt the call to go to Macedonia, and they went to a number of cities. We saw how they went to Thessalonica last week and to Berea, both places. They preached in the synagogues, people believed, but also persecution arose in both places. And Paul was brought to the city of Athens for his own safety. But while Paul was in Athens, he wasn't the type of fella just to kind of sit around and do nothing. He started walking the streets. And as he walked the streets, he saw all these idols, all the idols that people were worshipping. And it, it says in the NIV version that he was greatly distressed. The King James Version translates it as his spirit was stirred within him. What this phrase means, stirred within, it has a twofold meaning. One, it means to be spurred on. And the second meaning is to be provoked 
to anger. And I want to look at each of those meanings in turn. First, the first meaning is he was spurred on. He felt that he had to do something. He was so troubled to see these idols. And the reason he felt like he had to do something was because he had a heart for people. He saw that the people were worshipping idols. And he knew that this was a fruitless endeavor. The idols were just wood and stone. They were not able to help them. He knew that these people were missing the wonder, the joy, the freedom, the forgiveness, and the hope of having a relationship with the living God. The God who loved them so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for them. You know, when we look at people, often it's easy to see them as normal. They have their own friends. They have their own occupations. They have people to see places to go. But I think we need to learn to see people as God sees people. How does God see people? Well, he sees them as lost. He sees them as captives of Satan. And he also sees them as on the road to destruction. First, he sees them as lost. These people are investing their lives in things that are fruitless. Someone once said, the worst thing that can happen is you spend your whole life climbing the ladder and when you reach the top, you find out that it was leaning on the wrong wall. All the things that people chase after, all the idols, and idols aren't necessarily statues made of wood or stone. Idols are anything that we chase after that we think will give us fulfillment, peace, a reason to live, anything that is not God. And it doesn't matter what it is. We can try to run after anything for success, for money, for pleasure, friendship. All of those things will not satisfy us. It won't satisfy it because as Blaise Pascal said, we were created within us with a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. Only our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ can bring us joy and fulfillment. People are lost. But not only are people lost, but they're also captives of Satan. You know, this is what we see with our eyes, just physical. But people and this world, this reality is more than just physical. There's also a spiritual realm. And Jesus said that if people are not following him, if they're not children of God, if they haven't been forgiven and put their faith in Christ, then they are under the control of Satan. That's exactly what he says in Acts chapter 8, verses 42 to 47. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. Jesus makes it very clear. Either we are children of God, or we are children of the devil. And one of the characteristics of someone who is under the power of Satan, as Jesus said, is they are unable to hear. You know, I think one of the great deceptions of Satan is that he puts um, a wall, a barrier, in front of people so that they cannot encounter spiritual truth. C.S. Lewis, he writes in the book Screw Tape Letters, it's a book that um, is supposed to be a, a senior demon giving advice to a junior demon to keep his um, client from reaching heaven. And he, he says this in the story, he says, it's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. And I've experienced that. I've talked to different people and I've asked them spiritual questions. Often I'll ask them something like, what do you think is going to happen after you die? And almost 
Always. Their answer is, I don't know. And so I, it's usually I'll push a little further and I'll say, well, I know you don't know for sure, but what do you think is going to happen? And then they usually answer me, I, I haven't really thought about it. You see, Satan is skilled and he's hard at work to keep people from thinking about eternal issues. We have to realize that when we present the gospel, it's more than us just giving out facts, trying to change a person's mind. This is a spiritual endeavor. We are storming the very gates of hell. And it has to be by the Spirit of God that people can actually hear the truth and actually believe. The Spirit of God must open up a person's heart and must convict them in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. But not only are people lost, not only are they captives of Satan, but people are headed for destruction. Jesus is very clear in saying that there's only two destinations after we die. In Matthew chapter 7 verse, verses 13 to 14 he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus says there's only two destinations, the road to life and then the wide road to destruction. You see, people are created to be eternal. Yes, our mortal bodies will die, but our spirit will continue to live. And there's only two destinations, heaven with God or the other place, the place of punishment, hell. And the Bible describes hell in different ways, as a place of suffering, as a place of outer darkness, as a place of physical torment. In um, the book of Revelation, it's called the Lake of Fire. Now, you may say to me, Peter, aren't, aren't you being um, a little harsh? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe the Bible? If you say you believe the Bible, then you must believe in the existence of hell. Because hell is taught very clearly in the Bible. And if that's true, what that means is everyone you know, every friend, every co-worker, every relative, every fellow student, everyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ, everyone who has not committed their lives to follow Jesus Christ, they're on the road to destruction, to hell. You see, that's why Paul was so stirred up in his heart. That's what spurred him on because he had this love for people. I think we need to see people the way God sees people. C.S. Lewis, he quotes in um, a sermon called The Weight of Glory and this is what he says. It is a serious thing to live in the society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities it is with the awe and circums circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as a life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. How do we live a life of witnessing? First, 
We have to have a heart for people. We have to see them as God sees them. But not only do we have to have a heart for people, we also have to have a heart for God. This term, stirred up within, it can mean being spurred on, but it also can mean provoked to anger. What was Paul angry at when he saw these idols? Well, I believe he was angry because he saw that God was not receiving the glory that he was due. Instead, people were going to idols and worshipping idols and ignoring the true God, Yahweh, who created the nations, the earth, the heavens, the universe. And this God, our Yahweh, is a God who loves us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And people were ignoring this God. And that provoked Paul to anger. Isn't it just infuriating when someone else gets the credit that they don't deserve? They steal it from someone else. A couple of years ago, a movie came out. It was called Big Eyes, and it told the true story of a painter. Have you seen any pictures like this one? The painter of the picture was Margaret Keane. And in the early 1950s, Margaret was making ends meet, selling her paintings outside one of the San Francisco's many beatnik clubs. At some point, she started up a relationship with Walter. They got married, and for two years everything was fine. Then Margaret discovered her husband selling her paintings as his own. At this point, she probably should have left, but she instead stayed and became Walter's artistic slave. As the 50s rolled into the 60s, Walter made millions from his wife's paintings. He bought a gigantic house, paled around with movie stars, and lived a life of luxury. By contrast, Margaret was kept imprisoned in a tiny room, forced to paint for 16 hours a day. Walter refused her contact with the outside world and routinely threatened her with murder. The few times she tried to leave, Walter claimed that he would ruin her and their children. By 1970, Margaret had had enough. She left Walter and took, told the reporter everything. In the legal battle that followed, Walter nearly made good on his promise to ruin her. Then the judge had them both paint a picture in the courtroom, proving Margaret's claim. It's terrible when someone tries to steal the credit from the proper person who actually did it. And Paul was provoked to anger because he saw that people were not giving the glory to God that he deserved. How do we live a life of witnessing? Well, first, we have to have the right attitude. We have to have a love for people and also a love for God. The second point is this. Make use of every opportunity. Take a look at Acts chapter 17 verses 17 to 21. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Oropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. In this passage, we, saw, we see that Paul used every opportunity he had to share the gospel with people. He did it in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, but that wasn't enough. Then he went out in the marketplace and he started sharing with anyone who gathered to listen about Jesus Christ. As he was sharing, a group of philosophers came. They, it describes them as from two camps. Epicureans, 
who believed in the pursuit of pleasure, and Stoics who believed living um, a strict life, free from strong emotions. There are two philosophies on the opposite ends of the spectrum. And they heard Paul speak. And they'd heard a lot of different philosophies, but they never heard what Paul said before. So they invited him to come and to speak to the Oropagus. And what did Paul do? He agreed. He saw that this was a wonderful opportunity to present the gospel. Paul says in first Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jews then for the Gentiles and he didn't just write that he lived it out at every opportunity he shared the gospel whether it was in the synagogues whether it was in the marketplace whether it was before a large gathering of the whole city it didn't matter if it was Jews didn't matter if it was Gentiles any opportunity he had Paul shared the gospel how do we live a life of witnessing? We have to make use of every opportunity. Now, how do we do that? If you're like me, you're not like Paul. I'm not like Paul. I don't have this drive to naturally go out. Well, let me give you a couple of suggestions about how to make use of every opportunity. First, as you begin the day, pray and ask God to open your eyes to opportunities and to give you opportunities to share your faith. Ask God to give you eyes to see people as he sees them. And then as you go through the day, as you meet individuals, ask the Holy Spirit for opportunities to share with them. And look for them as you talk with people on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to just daily being aware of people and opportunities, a sex suggestion is to make up a prayer list of individuals, maybe friends, maybe co-workers, maybe fellow students, maybe family members who are not Christians, and put them on your prayer list. And pray for them on a daily basis. And when you pray for them, ask God for opportunity to share with them. And then go out of your way to make those opportunities. Make appointments with those people. See if you can meet up with them, have coffee with them, or talk with them over the phone, or maybe have a, a video conference chat with them. And as you are interacting with them, again, ask the Holy Spirit. To give you opportunities to share your faith with them. The third point, how do we live a life of witnessing? Number one, have a heart for people and a heart for God. Number two, make the most of every, every opportunity. But number three, begin where the listener is at. After we have taken every opportunity, we have an opportunity now to actually speak and share the gospel. What do we say? Let's look at what Paul said when he was before the Oropagus in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, 
we should not think about think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by man's design skill in the past god overlooked such ignorance but now he commands all people everywhere to repent for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice for the man he has appointed he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead paul had this wonderful opportunity to share before most of the city of Athens. Now, if you were in that position, how would you share the gospel? If it was me, I think maybe I'd share one of the gospel illustrations that I learned. Maybe I'd share the, the bridge illustration, or maybe I'd share um, the four spiritual laws, or maybe um, the Romans road working through the book of Romans. But what did Paul do? If you read the passage, he didn't do any of those things. Did he quote any scripture? Did he um, refer back to the Old Testament at all? N no, he didn't. Now, why was that? It was because he knew that what his listeners' background was. They weren't Jews. They weren't God-fearing Greeks. These were... Athenians who valued reason, who um, talked about different philosophies all day long. They didn't, they weren't familiar with the Bible. They didn't believe in the Bible. So what does Paul do? Well, he starts off the presentation by referring to an idol that he saw with the inscription to an unknown God. And using that as his jumping off point, he starts explaining to them about the true God. And instead of quoting scriptures, he quotes from the Greek um, poets down in verse 28. You see, Paul suited his message to where his listeners were at. He adjusted the gospel in a way that his listeners could receive. And could understand and when we come to people and share the gospel with them we have to do exactly the same thing we have to begin where the listener is at just think about how Jesus um, presented the gospel to people people who came to him people he met think about um, Nicodemus what did Jesus say to him when Nicodemus came to him at night, what Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Or th think about the woman at the well in the town of Sychar, the Samaritan woman that Jesus met. What did Jesus say? He said, you must drink from the spring of living water. Or think about the rich young ruler who came to him and asked him, what do I have to do to be saved? How did, how did Jesus answer? Well, he looked at him with compassion and said, you lack one thing. Sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. You see, Jesus didn't have one pattern, one way of sharing the good news. He treated each person unique, uniquely, according to their background. He knew exactly what they needed to hear. And when we come to people, we have to have the same approach. Now, we're not Jesus. We can't look into someone's heart and understand exactly what they need, what their background is, what has led them up to this point. So what we need to do is we need to ask questions and we need to listen well. We need to hear that other person's story and ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us how we can connect their story with God's story. Let me just give you three approaches that we need to adopt that will help us to get in tune with where our hearer is at. The first approach is this, focused presence. When we come to someone, we need to fix our attention upon them. We need to 
get rid of distractions and we need to be fully present. We need to be aware of what they communicate with us, not just the facts of what they say, but also their tone of voice, their body language. The second approach is compassionate listening. With compassionate listening, again, we listen not just for the facts, but we listen for the feelings, for the heart of what that person is trying to share. We don't interrupt, we don't give judgments about what they say, and we give enough space for them to share their entire story. And a third approach is evocative questioning. Evocative questioning means that we reflect back what the person has said to us so we can fully understand them. It means that we focus on feeling questions, questions about how and what. And then we connect their story with God's story. Just think about how many times when someone came to Jesus with a question. Jesus himself, he answered with another question. Jesus was always asking questions. And as we listen, as we come to understand the other person's story, then we'll be able to share. Share the gospel in a way that reaches the individual's needs. How do we live a life of witnessing? First, have a heart for people and a heart for God. Second, make use of every opportunity. And third, begin where the listener is at. And fourth, persevere in our witnessing. Take a look at Acts chapter 17, verses 32 to 34. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the, left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the Oropagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. After Paul spoke, in front of the Oropagus, what were the results? Well, it says that a few men became his followers. Now, for us, we might look at those results and we might give thanks about how God has worked. But for Paul, that result was uncharacteristic. Remember, Paul is a seasoned missionary and he was a powerful evangelist. In so many of the other cities and towns that he went to, large groups of people believed when he preached the gospel. In Thessalonica, in Berea, as we'll see in, in Ephesus, in Corinth, many people responded. Why were the results so meager? Well, I think it was because of the people he was addressing. As we've said before, these people were not Jews or God-fearing Greeks, people he'd usually address in synagogues, those people are prepared to hear the gospel because they have the Old Testament background. They know about the prophecies of the Messiah and they're looking forward to the Messiah. So for, G for Paul, his task was to prove to them that Jesus is the Messiah. But for the Athenians at the Oropagus, they didn't have any Bible backgrounds. In fact, they, they valued reason over everything. And they talked about all these different kinds of philosophies, all these different kinds of religions. They kind of tried to pick and choose. So it was much harder to reach them with the gospel. Now, if you think about Canada today, Canada in 2020, do you think most people in Canada, most Canadians, are they more like the Jews and and the God-fearing Greeks? Or are they more like the Athenians? Well, I think it's clear that most Canadians today are more like the ancient Athenians. There may have been a history of people having church backgrounds, but that's in the past. Today, especially amongst the younger population, people don't know the Bible. They haven't been in church. Now, they probably heard the name of Jesus Christ, but that's about it. They don't really know anything about him. And because people don't have a Bible background, then when we share with them 
the task is much slower. The response is much less. Now I'm not saying that people are less responsive today than in the past, but what I am saying is because they don't have a background, their response is much slower. Someone once said that um, it takes an average of a person hearing the gospel seven times before they can believe. I don't know if that statistic is true, but I do know that asking someone to make a huge commitment, a commitment to following Jesus Christ, to believing in Him, that will change their life. That is a very difficult decision to make on your first encounter. Just imagine if um, you tried to set up um, your, your best friend who is single with another guy that you met at work who's, who's single and they go out for the first date and then you can't wait to meet with her and then when you do after you ask how the date was and she saw, says, oh he's a really nice guy. What's the next thing you ask? Do you ask, when are you going to marry him? <laughs> no, of course you don't ask him that. You ask her, when are you going to see him next? Trying to present the gospel to someone who's never heard it the first time and asking for commitment is kind of like asking someone who's been out on a date once to marry the other person. We have to give people time. We have to get out of the mindset of presenting the gospel that we kind of dump all of the information upon the person. And then we try to close the deal, kind of like a a used car salesman and try to make them pray a prayer. We have to get the mindset that this is a work of God. It's not us at all. And it's in God's timing that someone will come to have a relationship with Him. Instead of picturing us um, closing the deal on a contract, we should see witnessing as trying to get someone one step closer to God whatever that step might look like. And because this is a work of God, then we have to be devoted to prayer. I love the story of uh, George Mueller. Let me read this story. One day, George Mueller began praying for five of his friends. After many months, one of them came to the Lord. Ten years later, two others were converted. It took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. Mueller persevered in prayer until his death for the fifth friend. And throughout those 52 years, he never gave up hoping that he would accept Christ. His faith was rewarded, for soon after Mueller's funeral, the last one was saved. To live a life of witnessing, you have to have a heart for people and a heart for God. We have to make use of every opportunity. We have to start where the listener is at, and we have to persevere in our witness. And as we end this message, we're going to end it in a time of prayer. And I would invite you to lift up one person who you want, who isn't a Christian now, but you want them to come to faith and present that person to God and pray for them. And then ask God for an opportunity to share your faith with this individual. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you had mercy upon us. When we weren't searching for you, you found us. You revealed to us that you love us and that you gave your son to die for us. And you gave us the faith to believe. You cleansed us and you adopted us as your children. Father, because we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we want all of our friends, our family, the people around us to come to know you. Right now, Lord, I pray that you would lay upon our hearts one person you want us to pray for and reach out to.
Father, please help us to continue to pray for this individual and give us opportunity to reach out to them, to share the love of God that you've given us to them, that they might come to know you and believe in you. And I pray these things in Christ's powerful name. Amen.